Hello and welcome back to The Note. Let's talk today about one of the most important topics afflicting the world economy and markets, which is foreign exchange accumulation. Reserves have been rising very steadily for many years, but that process has now started to go into reverse. What impact could this have on the world economy? Could this be dangerous or is it merely part of a steady recalibration of the global economic balance? With me now to discuss this is the Chief Economist for so Société Générale's uh, uh, Commercial in, in, uh, and Investment Bank, Michaela Markison. Thank you very much for Thank joining you. me in New York. Let's start by taking a look at the overall picture. You can see reserves, particularly in emerging markets, rose very dramatically for a long time and have started to fall very noticeably in the last year or so. That picture is even clearer if we take a look at, uh, look at that in terms of the change in official foreign exchange reserves uh, in emerging markets. Why have we started to see that fall in reserves? I think there are a couple of different things going on. First of all, there's clearly a valuation effect which we have to consider. Mm. Obviously, a stronger dollar means that other elements of the reserves are weaker and that leads mechanically to a decline. Second factor, however, is what we've seen going on in terms of the capital flows. And mm. I think China is a particularly good point here where we've seen in domestic outflows coming from the emerging economies and as such a response from central banks stepping in to counter those flows by selling their reserves on their, on the, in terms of the currency impact. Now let's try to look at that, this in more detail because this is very important. What we're looking at here is the composition of China's capital outflows. Some of, those, uh, some of these measures might not be f familiar to everyone. We have net errors and emissions, non-resident flows. What is happening in this chart? How does this all add up to the total capital flows that we see? So essentially what we're seeing is the, the very first line is, is really a summary of, of what the dominant force there is really Chinese companies paying back foreign debt. And in many ways that's quite a healthy thing mm. because we have to remind ourselves that the Chinese currency actually hasn't depreciated that much at this point in time. So if you're concerned about future depreciation, paying back now is probably a good thing. Second thing, the net errors and emissions. This is an interesting one because we don't really know what that is at the end of the day, but what we do observe is historically it correlates quite well to the currency movements, which does suggest that it is flows that are, are looking to react in response to currency movements. And then the third element that we're looking at is what in particular the households are doing. And what we see is that Chinese households are looking to invest abroad at this point in time. And I think these are some of the concerns that we can have is that the, the Chinese residents choose to or try to diversify more abroad at this point in time. If they do so in a big and quick way, it can turn very disorderly. But there's no clear evidence that that's happening thus far. What, what, what we're talking about here isn't the big central bank reserve management effect. This is more about a mass of people with certain amounts of money choosing to put that money outside of China. So I think it boils down to a question of confidence. If, mm. if domestic investors are very concerned and seek to go abroad, you can paint a very bad scenario, but this is not our base case, and this really isn't what we've been seeing so far. We have seen some movement on the, on the, on the capital account, so there are some concerns out there, and mm. we do need to be alert to them. But what we really have to imagine that we're seeing is a switch between private and official investors, which is also part of a structural story. If we look to the longer term, we do expect China to become more financially integrated. China is about 15% of the global economy, mm. a big chunk uh, in terms of the global trade, but a very low share of financial integration measured on the gross international investment position, so external assets plus external liabilities. China is only about 3% of the global total, which is incredibly low for the size of the economy. So okay. part of the reform process is opening up and diversifying. Okay. Meanwhile, America continues to be overrepresented in terms of financial power in that way compared to the, the size of its economy. Very quickly, if we take a look at this final chart, China's top capital outflows, we can see again, um, non-resident banking is the largest factor. Uh, that again would basically back up your suggestion that this is primarily about households moving their money overseas rather than about big deliberate moves by the central bank. I don't think the central bank is driving the process. My, my view is that the central bank would rather be responding to a process 
than driving a process in this point in time. So if you imagine a scenario where you see more stress on the capital account, at the end of the day, the PBOC will have a choice, either to intervene and, and run down reserves. And even though China's reserves are large, they're not large enough to do that on a big scale for a long time, mm. or alternatively, to let the currency go. So in such a bad case scenario, our expectation is that the currency would at some point be let go. But again, I emphasize that's not our baseline view today. Okay, Nicola, thank you very much indeed. Thank there, you. Is, there is very much more to this subject than can meet the eye. Plainly, there is the possibility that this turns into an ugly scenario. As it stands at the moment, though, no, it isn't necessarily anything more than a manifestation of the rebalancing of the Chinese economy.